Ireland's population is growing. It is expected to increase by more than 1 million over the next 20 years. If current trends continue, this will further fuel demand for new housing in the outer suburbs and commuter belts of our cities. This in turn would push up vehicle emissions and lock in the already crippling effects of gridlock. To avoid the repercussions of urban sprawl, a new national planning framework calls for a reimagining of our urban centres to be more than just commercial hubs, but also vibrant places to live. So, what could this really mean for our cities and their future? For many thousands of years, the density of cities have made them the primary engines of innovation and economic growth all over the world. But our cities are now going through a crisis. To get a sense of how and why cities need to reinvent themselves, I'm here in Ireland's real capital, Cork City, with Dr. Frank Crowley, a spatial economist who has a unique insight into the future of cities like Cork. So why does a city like Cork matter for, for people in Ireland? We're expecting 70% of the world's population to be in urban areas by 2050. So it's important that we start to get city making right in Ireland. So Frank, if we look at Cork City relative to European cities, we're doing quite well because we've attracted an awful lot of foreign direct investment. Key weaknesses, I suppose, of our provincial cities is indigenous industry, for instance. And if we look at other types of cities throughout the world, um, what's extremely important is having a strong indigenous company base. Entrepreneurs want to set up in kind of very livable type of environments now. This is a new model for them. They want to have a good mix in terms of the work life, but also social life um, and a good balance. So the types of things like congestion, spending a lot of time in traffic, happiness damaging type of activities are going to be a drag on our competitiveness and future growth. Obviously housing is important too. If we look at our city cores, there's really a lack of planning for families. We need more family style type of apartments and developments. We need more green areas, we need more playgrounds. But also it needs to be more inclusive, it needs to be affordable. We have sprawled out. So we have this problem that's there. And obviously we can see it on our roads now, the massive amount of congestion. Are we still putting too much emphasis on facilitating the car? Like there's a planning architecture in place. It's not by chance that this has happened. Uh, we have decided that we're going to have a satellite town in such and such a place with a population of 20,000 people, and these people will commute to a segregated workplace. Um, so you have this to and fro of different uh, segregated areas. If we had more families living within the, the city centre, it would completely underpin the survival and the resilience of these businesses going forward. It will create an innovative environment. You'll get more entrepreneurial development happening and spinning off from that type of ecosystem that would happen. Um, and these are the type of aspects that we need to be thinking about in terms of Irish growth and Irish development and our provincial cities. But not only that, are also our regional towns and our villages. My take from Frank is that if we want our cities to have a prosperous future, then they need to become more vibrant and livable to rival any European city. So how do we make this happen? Well, that's just what recently returned couple Frank and Jude are hoping to do. They're leading a campaign to breathe new life back into Cork's old town centre. So we moved here nearly two years ago from Amsterdam. And the similarities were, I was quite astounded by the similarities between Cork and Amsterdam. They're both built on marshes. They're both built by the Dutch with and built a lot of brick buildings as well. We wanted to be in a situation where we didn't own a car, that we could walk and cycle everywhere. So we started to explore the city. Yeah. And we were struck by the beauty, obviously, and the friendliness of the people. Yeah. But yeah. also we were struck by the dereliction and decay. As we walk from South Main Street to North Main Street, still in the historic spine of the city, you begin to see some of the dereliction. You see the crumbling buildings here, beautiful architecture, dating back quite a while but you're struck by the fact that in, we're in the old part of the city, yet 
this dereliction has been allowed to happen. You know, why in the old part of the city, which should be protected, should be restored, people should be living here, have you got this crumbling architecture, which is an eyesore? And they are mostly privately owned buildings. Mostly yeah, privately owned. Yeah. And is it that they just can't afford to do something with the buildings? Or? I suppose you're not questioning people's integrity or intentions. It's the results is what we're seeing. You know, we're seeing this is a result. There's no reason why a, a, an owner can't just sit on their land at the moment and, and speculate. So it really is up to the government to, to bring in those pressures on owners who, who take, that, take that approach and then help, help the owners who actually do want to regenerate their properties and do want to bring them back into use. So it's, it needs to be a mix of measures. And you know, all of these buildings could have people living in them. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you think for city living, I mean, if you increase the density for these streets alone, uh, what a difference it would make. It would make a difference in terms of obviously people, in terms of travelling to work, uh, in terms of supporting the retail, uh, pubs, shops, everything really. It is a shame. And I think other countries seem to recognise the heritage value and the economic potential that can be generated from that. There's no doubt that Cork has plenty of untapped potential, but there's still lots of buzz on its lively streets. Under COVID-19 measures, Princess Street was shut down from traffic, so cafes and restaurants could trade outdoors. So uh, tell me, how come this didn't happen before? All of us are entrepreneurs and in a time of crisis, we always have to find solutions. I think the success of here is the diversity. So you can have, you can go to Clare Space, Our Space, or Salvatore's, which is Italian. People want to sit outside, they want to be on the fresh air. Especially a lot of people locked indoors for many months. It's given us honestly a new lease of life. Long term, Duncan, this is something like that we will support the city with. It's and great, it's, it is. it's like city. going into, say, Paris or Amsterdam or any of yeah, our cities. Yeah. Magic. Outer city vibrancy, social interactions and exchanging of ideas are some of the fundamentals of what makes cities great. But great cities don't just happen by accident, they're planned. And here in Cork is one of the best planning schools in the country. So this is a great opportunity to learn from an expert about what are some of the most important ingredients for good city planning. The reality is that the, the best planning ideas are very simple. So there's a really famous example in Scandinavia, this famous finger plan from Copenhagen dating back to 1947. So there's a very simple idea that the city would simply grow in the form of fingers and that the city at centre itself would be on the fjord and that over the years there would be transport uh, and service corridors along the fingers. Copenhagen has actually developed in that way. Copenhagen's densified city and finger plan, with a focus on streets are for people and green civic spaces, are some of the ingredients of why it's regarded as one of the most livable cities in the world. Dereliction doesn't exist in Copenhagen because of the demand for urban housing. And we could ask ourselves, can we do something like that for Cork? I mean, could we have a simple uh, plan on one page that everybody could buy into? So a very famous plan that was dr drafted in Cork in the 1970s, 1978 Lutz Plan. The Lutz Plan focused development into the city core and satellite towns by maintaining a green belt around the city. While the Lutz Plan wasn't always adhered to, it did maintain a basic shape of the city. The, the green belt is the, the tool, the urban containment tool, which prevents the sprawl, but then gives each of the individual towns a chance to grow in its own right. So on the edge of the city, in the green belt, um, the, a, a temptation to eat up the countryside. And we know that has a, it has a direct negative impact on the city centre itself and city life, especially if we develop at a low density. Um, so this pattern, if it, was continue, if it were to continue, would be a recipe for sprawl. Um, and that's the challenge that all cities have to deal with. This resistance to sprawl into the green belt is the best tool Cork has for revitalising the city core. It puts pressure then on people to develop in the middles of the towns, developing the brownfield sites. So Danny and Cork also has to look at the city centre itself. So there's a lot of urban capacity in the old part of town in terms of redevelopment, where we can reuse old buildings and, and, and find ways, imaginative ways, of using um, reusing land in the city centre. For sustainability, we really need most of our new housing in particular to be on land that's previously used rather than green belt land. So does the local authority's vision live up to the ideals of what the city could be? To find out, 
I'm meeting the Chief Executive of Cork City Council, Anne Doherty. As you know, Duncan, Ireland's national plan sees population growth across the country, but for Cork, we're seeing uh, the potential of increasing our population by 50% over the next 20 years. We're very fortunate uh, to be able to support that population growth by having this amazing uh, brownfield site here behind you, which is the Cork Docklands, uh, one of the biggest brownfield sites in Europe uh, with the potential to accommodate almost 30,000 people over that next 20 years. Cork City is borrowing 700 million euro to help regenerate huge swathes of brownfield sites in the city centre, which is expected to leverage 5 billion euro of private capital that will completely transform the city core. Keys here and the city for, um, for the Docklands then to become what it really can be. A great neighbourhood, a place where people can work, where they can live, but also where they can recreate close to the city centre. So I think that's the real genesis of the future of Cork. There is quite a bit of dereliction around the city too. And there is, of course, in Dublin and there's Limerick. Mm. I mean, it's not just in Cork. But we're very conscious that there's a lot of opportunity for the people to come back into the city and live in the city centre, you know, in those existing buildings. So you're right, there's lots of vacancy in the city. Um, historically, lots of older buildings. We have to look at how do we densify our city. And there are going to be hard conversations and hard decisions to be made both by the elected body of Cork City Council who will approve our development plan, but also for citizens who will have to engage that, uh, that change. Cork Council's grand ambition to develop this abandoned industrial site could be game-changing for the city. But I feel Cork and all our cities will only realise their full potential when we find solutions to the dereliction and vacancy problems that plague our historic urban areas. With this in mind, I'm heading north to Limerick City. Once regarded as the most beautiful city in Ireland, Limerick has some of the most intact Georgian architecture in the world. Georgian architecture is typified by dense but beautiful terrace streets of tall brick buildings laid out along wide granite pavements with plenty of urban parks and squares that were a critical part of the vibrant livable city movement two centuries ago. But today, much of Limerick's incredible historic core lies dormant and underoccupied. When you consider that thousands of city workers commute daily by car, you begin to see the lost opportunity. Keen O'Flaherty is the CEO of a new tech company, partnering with the council to find solutions to some of the obstacles holding back renovations of our heritage buildings. Limerick has one of the most integral Georgian cores left in the country. It's remarkably undisturbed in many places, but the vacancy rate over first floor can be 45%, and it can go as high as 60 or 70% in, in the, the higher floor, floors. Up to 60% of these are unoccupied. Exactly, leading to vacancy rates that could house four, or 6,000 people in the city centre comfortably. And it's prime real estate. Right in the centre, you're walking distance from everything you'd need in the city centre. And you really hit the nail on the head of something that's been really very close to my heart for a long time. And, you know, where I feel in a way ashamed in Ireland that we have not been able to address this problem of dereliction in our cities, of leaving these wonderful... Georgian and historic buildings fall apart and at the same time denying people that have to make long commutes into cities when they could be living in these wonderful buildings. Why is it that Ireland is the exception that we don't seem to be able to get this right? Yeah. Why is it that they have so much dereliction? I think what is it about our system? When somebody says I'm going to make sure that we get a usable city, um, they face without really realising it once they acquire the building they're taking on the challenge of politically managing your planning process, but also project managing your competing interests from your conser conservation officer, your fire safety officer. Some of your planning authorities might have something to say around the use of the building and what you're planning to do with it. And I'm not sure that many people are prepared for 
the length of time it takes to broker these relationships and, and these challenges, expensive. incredibly expensive. So even though I'm using a building and I'm renting a building, I'm doing the bare minimum to keep that building in place and I'm continuing to rent it out. And it's very difficult to encourage upgrades and very difficult to encourage the return to use of derelict or vacant spaces. There are a number of really attentive landlords and owners in the city who are extremely keen to make these buildings livable. But the difficulty that those landowners and those property owners face is the thicket of regulation and the tension that comes up when you're converting a historical building with modern expectations around fire safety, around building safety. In a Georgian building, that's an extremely difficult thing to achieve because you can't put neatly a second stairwell into this building. Absolutely. And fire protected. And fire protected. And so compartmentalization would be between floors and between spaces within the floors would be vital to stop the spread of fire. And that fire officer may potentially say, unless we can get a second stairwell into this building, we're bricking up the fourth floor for use. It's not going to be possible. So Keen, what can you do that can enable that solution to be overcome? What we're trying to work on is getting the building to report on itself. So if you can automate the monitoring of the fire safety in the building, you can use sensoring technologies to stream data so that it is possible to manage fire safety on an ongoing maintenance basis. We're making the technology that lets that happen at a manageable cost at install and allows for the streaming data to be reported uh, where the fire safety officers can see it, where the tenants and the landlords are alerted and intervene at the right level when things need to be done to keep the building safe. But it's also making an allowance to say, these buildings form part of our cultural fabric and are not going to be able to achieve the standards of a new build. In many ways, what makes this city and its historic buildings so special is also what's holding the city back. The unintended consequences of protection orders, combined with the lack of will of some property owners has amounted to an effective destruction of our city's heritage. How are you? In search of solutions, I'm meeting the head of Limerick Council's Urban Innovation Unit, Rosie Well. Yeah, is it lovely up here? There's probably an awful lot of these houses here in the city centre that are owned by private people, and really they just sit on them and they don't really see the urgency for them to become dwellings, you know, yeah. and they just, more and more dereliction takes place. How do you as a local authority make them do something about this? In Ireland in particular, there are a few problems around that, like we don't have a, a property tax that's enough to make anyone do anything, we don't have a site value tax, and so there are very few disincentives for people to treat their, their property other than anything about a bank account. We really can't leave that scenario as it is. We need to make sure that we use all of our statutory powers to you know, try to um, push people into developing their properties or utilizing them to, to the, most, the most that they can. Um, but then we're also setting up a one-stop shop so it's easier for people to come in and solve that problem. We have a tax incentive that pays for basically 50% of the cost of doing up the old buildings, but people need to know about it. They need to be able to be brought through that process because it involves lots of different people in the council, conservation officer, the fire officer, the planner. We get them together in one space and explain the tax incentive and get, bring them sort of step by step through the process of doing up an older building. If Limerick Council's plan works, this would be a huge boost to the city and could provide a template for the rest of the country. But if Limerick is to become a truly livable city, it also needs to overcome its traffic congestion problem. Elish Drake is a member of the Limerick Pedestrian Network who may just have the answer. This is Newtown Perry and uh, when, when New, in, in the 19th century Newtown Perry was considered you know, a re far superior Georgian city than even Dublin. It was in the 1990s then that the traffic plan was changed to bring all the true traffic through both the medieval and the Georgian centre. So this has made a very like hostile environment. We have, uh, we have a ring road around Limerick um, which is a toll road but people are choosing to drive through the city instead of taking the toll because obviously it's free to drive through the city. 
you know, it's polluted, it's noisy, it's just not a nice place to be. And I think that's had a huge adverse uh, impact on the street. It's been detrimental in terms of businesses and people living on the street because who wants to live on a noisy, polluted uh, street? What I feel in terms of the historic city centre is that we should be completely reducing the cars and traffic. And that is not pedestrianisation. That's basically putting people before cars so that if somebody needs to get in, if I need to drop my mother into an appointment in the doctor in the city centre, I can do that. Eilish's plan is to use the grids of George and Limerick to create pedestrian zones where people can escape the noise and hazards of the traffic. She brought me to a small example of what this city could look like if her ideas were realised. Little Catherine Street brought in restricted traffic measures to improve the outdoor cafe culture. What? Isn't this a lovely street? It's fabulous, yeah. I bet you love being here. Oh, I love it, yes. What? Are there reasons, though, why they're not more, a lot more of these? There's a lot of polarised um, opinion about traffic and pedestrianisation in the city, and there are groups of vested interests who do not want to have more pedestrian space in the city because they want to be able to bring their car everywhere. And this really, I suppose, comes from the kind of the age-old idea that you can you can drive your car right up and park outside uh, outside the shop. And you can see that this street has really even blossomed since, since it was put in, and, and more cafes are coming to here because obviously that's where people want to be. Wouldn't it be lovely? The whole city was like this. It's great to see an example of city living work on one little street corner. I hope this is something that can be built on. Limerick are working on so many innovative approaches to overcome many of the challenges that all our cities face. But not to be outdone by Cork, Limerick has a monumental brownfield development of its own right in the heart of the city. What we're doing here is creating a new heart for the Limerick City. You know, I'm a passionate Limerick man that's been born and bred here, and to see this site derelict for the last number of years, and now that we're in building it new life, new culture, new restaurants, new public spaces, new amenities, a new library for the city, it'll just be fantastic for the city in the Midwestern region. Limerick Council's unique approach Limerick 2030, a new company who are acquiring prime location brownfields like this to be regenerated in the public interest. The Opera Square will consist of Limerick's tallest office building, cafes, restaurants and an open square to breed new life back into the city core. David, one of the issues that I have that I'm very concerned about, we have an awful lot of dereliction still in our cities and we've an awful lot of brownfield sites like this lying idle for years. And then, of course, when developers do buy them, they're always trying to kind of maximise profit, you know? And then they don't really think in terms of the common good, the public spaces, the public realm, you know, the important issues that are, that are needed to be addressed. We're probably unique. I don't think there's any other county council in, in Ireland that has such a company, but we specialise in driving these sites forward to delivery. But we have a social conscience at the same time, where we're trying to make sure that the commercial elements are mixed in with the public realm spaces and the public need. So this is going to be a really big addition now to... This the will region. be a statement for the city and the people of Limerick. It is fantastic. We want this to be like comparable with any European major site. Wonderful opportunity. It's brilliant. Fantastic. It's absolutely fantastic for the city. That's great. Lovely. Yeah. Thank you. This idea of a local authority-owned company redeveloping our urban centres for the public good could be a template for the rest of the country. All local authorities are required to produce new spatial plans over the next two years. These plans will be open to public consultation on local authority websites, which gives us all an opportunity to have our say in how our urban areas will be reshaped in the years ahead.